I think we're going to try and get started for the uh, Pointing Flux session. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Yue Deng, um, and she's going to begin a talk on uh, dual heating. So, um, yeah, if we could have uh, uh, Yue Deng to talk. Excuse me, Alex. Oh, this is got it. All right. Um, first, thanks for the invitation. Um, um, it's, it's my pleasure to present in this session. Actually, the topic pointing flux and dual heating is really close to my heart, and I started working on this pro this uh, related topic when I was a graduate student 20 years ago. And um, so I'm very happy to talk about that. My uh, practice and my experience related with pointing flux and geoheating. And I'd like to share my opinions with you. First of all, regarding the estimation of Alan, uh, the question, the first question is, what's the contribution of the mass scale electro field? And um, as we know, the observation shows in addition to the large-scale electrofield, which is driven by DC current, there are lots of electrofield variabilities which are related with AC current in the uh, mass scale or small scale. And those AC-driven electrofield or current, uh, AC current-driven electrofield can strongly contribute to the energy estimation so how can we take, you know, including those kind of mass scale electrofield variability uh, contribution to the energy budget? And uh, in my previous study, we uh, basically tried the parameterization. We calculated the statistical behavior of electro variability. Then we uh, implement the electrofield variability, like a standard deviation, from the climatologic study, then we flip the electrofield variability uh, every certain time period. So that's a parameterization. I didn't show that, but I'll just let you know we did something related. Um, and the better way is to resolve it. Uh, since the recent development in the super down observations, now we can get a high resolution anchor action pattern from super down. Maybe can we just directly use the observation and uh, resolve the mass scale in certain level and see the impact on the geoheating. And the second topic I'd like to share with you is the attitudinal distribution of geoheating. And uh, since the thermosphere is not homogeneous, so same amount of energy, if it deposited in the E region attitude, and uh, it will cause much less disturbance at the no Earth orbit, like 400 kilometer, then the energy deposited in the F region. So I'm going to show that in the later, you know. The attitude in the distribution of where the energy really goes is also very important for the thermosphere disturbance. Oh, oh, uh, probably I can do that. Oh, by the way, um, there's definitely a, you know, a, a group work, you know, uh, most of the work has been done by, uh, by the teams, uh, uh, including Chen, Qing Yu, you know, uh, Dolores, Neil, uh, Fair, Aaron, and uh, Beer as well. It's a, a large team effort. And uh, the main simulation model we used is a global atmosphere model. And uh, as you know, Gitting is a general circulation model, including the uh, 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 basically the equations for both density, velocity, and uh, energy or temperature. Um, the major new feature of Gitten compared with other GCMs uh, includes the flexible grid resolution, 
So you can increase the degrees either in longitude and latitude or altitude. Uh, it's quite flexible. Oh, oops, it's advanced. And, um, oh, sorry. It solves the vertical moment equation, so you can, it can resolve the non hydrostatic uh, uh, processes, um, uh, which may be important in the mass scale and uh, for the transient phenomena as well. All right. Um, here just shows the distribution of the high resolution superdown uh, convection. The detailed description can be found in Beer's paper. So I'm not an expert of superdown. I just uh, try to understand their data product and uh, their approach. Um, uh, basically, the started from the superdown line of cell observations, then applied the local divergence free fitting, LDFF to get the high resolution velocity map. Then based on the velocity map, they can deduce the potential pattern, okay? And the spatial resolution is determined by the resolution of the observations. Yes, so how high the resolution uh, observations is, then you can get the uh, high resolution of the convection pattern. And uh, particularly we um, did some study for this March 26, 2020, 2014 event. Um, here just to show several potential patterns from the superdome. The first one is just the global no resolution pattern, and uh, uh, probably you can get it from the superdome website. And here just to shows the local high potential pattern from uh, beer, beer's process. And then we can merge those two to get a merged potential pattern with not just scale in the background, but the updated high resolution in the localized region. And this localized region or high resolution domain, uh, the size is close to 30 degree in magnetic latitude and 175 degree in magnetic longitude. And the uh, resolution in that regional domain is close to half degree in latitude and one degree in uh, magnetic longitude. And uh, it would be ideal if we get a high resolution in the whole domain. Unfortunately, that's not the case yet. Uh, definitely, we're looking forward to that. Um, then we use the either way the global potential pattern or the merged potential, pa uh, potential pattern to drive Gaten and see the consequence in the geoheating. And here we go. So the left panel shows the global, you know, uh, the potential distribution driven by the global no resolution potential pattern. And the middle one shows the geoheating driven by the merged pattern. And the right panel shows the difference between those two. Clearly, in the high resolution domain, the geoheating got enhanced significantly. And uh, during that regional domain, the geoheating on on average, got increased by almost 60%. So definitely, it's not negligible. Um, well, this is just a snapshot during a storm period. Uh, we would like to see the performance during the whole storm period. Then we calculated the uh, total geo heating in the whole polar region with the high resolution domain blue line without the high resolution domain black line. Then we calculate the difference between those two cases and we got the red line in the top panel. We also look at the percentage difference uh, of the dry heating between those two cases. And if we look at the average performance during the whole storm period, the value uh, is close to 30%. So in average, the geoheating got enhanced by 30% during this whole storm period when including the high resolution uh, electrical convection pattern from Superdome. Um, this dash line just marks the time we look at in the previous slide, the slapshot time, right? <coughs> Sorry. So the value can be, you know, uh, goes to 60% or even higher. And then we just take a quick, quick look at the impact on the uh, neutral wing. 
And certainly after including the high resolution correction pattern, um, strongly improved the represents of master scale neutral wind perturbation, including the horizontal wind, which represented by the vector, and also vertical wind, which represented by the color control. So basically, again, you know, the left panel is uh, driven by the smooth the global pattern, and the middle panel is driven by the merged pattern, and the right panel is driven by, uh, basically the difference between those two represent the contribution of the mass scale electro field. So definitely it's uh, important for the thermosphere as well, right? Um, all right, next, let's move on to the uh, soft particle precipitation. And um, the top panel basically shows the uh, so right, well, uh, modeling experiment we did like 10 years ago. And uh, so we have a theoretical event happening start, you know, starting at this time. And we just artificially turn off the heating about 150 kilometers. So uh, only keep the dry heating enhancement from 100 to 150. So in the E region, dry heating, uh, we still keep it in the simulation. But I turn off the heating above that. Then here we got the neutral density perturbation like this during this artificial you know, event. And the red panel shows I just keep the dry heating enhancement in the all altitudes. So the difference between these two panels shows the significance of dry heating deposited at the altitude above 150 kilometers, which roughly represents the dry heating deposited in the F region. So you can see the difference between these two figures is, is, is quite clear, and which indicates you know, the um, neutral density perturbation at, for example, 300 kilometer altitude may be driven primarily by the geoheating enhancement in the F region altitude. So it's very sensitive to the heating uh, deposited in the F region. All right, uh, keep this in mind. So F region geoheating could be important for the neutral density perturbation at the no Earth's orbit satellite. And uh, then we look at the soft particle precipitation. And the DMSP observation indicates the max waning distribution of the particle uh, precipitation strongly underestimate the soft particle precipitation. Could be you know, more than one order magnitude. And um, so therefore, the underestimation of soft particle uh, precipitation may contribute to the underestimation of neutral density you know, doing, uh, from the simulation of GCMs. Uh, that's reported by uh, um, Barbara Emery uh, in 1995 paper. So GCMs usually underestimate the, the neutral density perturbation during a stone time. So why? And the one possible reason you know, is underestimation of your heating. And another reason could be the uh, inaccuracy of the attitudinal distribution of your heating through underestimation of the soft particle. Because you have not soft particle in the simulation, then maybe uh, you will underestimate the your heating deposited in the F region. And indeed, we did some, uh, some uh, again, simulation experiment. And when the energy of the uh, particle precipitation goes down to 200 EV, then the impact on the uh, neutral density at 400 kilometer increased dramatically. So we basically keep the same amount of total energy for the particle. We just change the, character uh, the characteristic energy of the, of the particle precipitating in the upper atmosphere. We found when the energy goes down, energy goes down, the impact on the neutral density actually goes up. Okay, so if you uh, we go down to 100 EV, the the enhancement on the neutral density can be more than 20 percent. So way more efficient than the uh, probably KEV particles. 
All right. Um, then we basically you five years GMSP data to created a new model, actually, auroral energy spectrum and high latitude electron field uh, variabilities. And uh, this model actually has three components, actually A, actually E, and actually E var. And actually A stands for the aurora, and I'm uh, only going to emphasize this component here. Um, our approach is to basically um, being the 19, DMS, uh, 19 energy channel from the DMSP observation directly, instead of assuming any uh, spectrum, according to the uh, uh, geophysical conditions, solar wind geophysical conditions. And then for each particular solar wind condition, we get 19 maps instead of one or two, you know, one. Typically, you get two. One for total flux, one for uh, average energy or characteristic energy. And now, if we bin the 19 energy channel directly, for each condition, you can directly get 19 uh, distribution maps. And uh, uh, each one for one particular energy channel. And uh, the bottom two panels roughly represent the distribution of the soft particle. If you compare the distribution of soft particle with the KeV particles, they're quite different. For example, for the 154 uh, EV channel, it has a peak in the, uh, well, close to cusp region. Maybe it's, it's safe to say day side uh, polar cap region. And uh, meanwhile, latitudinal distribution is it, it more close to higher latitude uh, than the auroral zone, uh, you know, showing in the KUV particle precipitation as well. So it goes to high latitude and uh, could peak in the day side, you know, on the day side uh, polar cap region. And uh, then we compare the, you know, uh, particular location. We found indeed this model can provide almost the two orders of magnitude. Uh, higher flux for the softer particle than the Maxwellian distribution, and which is consistent with the uh, uh, DEC observation as well. Uh, next, we apply this model for a event study, which is August, August 2003 storm. And uh, this particular storm is uh, uh, why uh, DMSP goes down to almost 150 nanotesla. So it's a magnetic uh, cloud event. And we see how the uh, soft particle impacts the energy input and the neutral density as well. And uh, here just shows the percentage difference of the geoheating per unit, uh, I think it's per unit, per unit mass, uh, global averagely, when we use actually worse the Maxwellian distribution. So roughly represent the, the impact of the soft particle precipitation. So including the soft particle precipitation strongly enhanced the geoheating in the F region. Uh, for example, at a 400 kilometer attitude, global averagely, the, I cannot read, um, the enhancement is close to 25%. And it is it, um, also enhanced the uh, temperature by more than 10%, and the neutral density got enhanced by uh, almost 20%. And the bottom two panels shows the distribution of the neutral density uh, enhancement caused by the soft particle. Well, the soft particle is mainly, uh, like what I showed in previous slide, mainly deposited in the high latitude region. However, the impact on the neutral density it's not limited in the high latitude region at all because you know the convections, neutral convections and dynamics brings the enhancement everywhere. So you can see it extended to the mid and low latitude, even close to the equator. Okay. And uh, so it can cause a global uh, enhancement of neutral density. All right, and here just shows the comparison 
with the CHAMP and the GRACE observation um, along the satellite trajectory. And the black line is the CHAMP observation, and the green line is uh, the simulation for the max uh distribution for the particles. And the red line is driven by the uh, Ashley. So including the soft particle precipitation definitely strongly enhanced the data model comparison, um, bring the, uh, them together. All right, in summary, um, the high resolution super down convection definitely improves our capability to resolve the massive scale electro field instead of parameterization, which strongly increases geoheating heating and massive scale neutral dynamics. And a soft electron can efficiently change the attitudinal distribution of geoheating, heating, increase the density at F reaching attitude, and improve the data model comparison. Um, certainly, we have more work to do in the future. Uh, we need to you know, include the particle precipitation. What we, we, did, we did some experiment with the particle precipitation. I think Chen is going to report that in the in, in other session. Um, but we need to, oh, I'm sorry. We need to consider how to do that in a more consistent way. How to make this two forcing to be consistent, or correlation, or you know, uh, maybe we can talk about some expert. How can we do that in a smart way? And um, meanwhile, you know, regarding the soft particle precipitation, uh, in addition to do more events, we also may need to think about how to do that for a uh, quiet time and more. Broad variation definitely is needed. All right, thank you. That's it. Okay. Um, I have a question about. Um, Neutral winds response, you're, you're showing at the F region winds or the E region winds? So you're assuming electrostatic potential, oh, um, you're, uh, mm, right? So uh, super yeah. down, high res. Right. Uh, that's neutral wind is F region, indeed. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the E region winds? Uh, I think 10, probably, uh, yeah, better person to address the question if I'm wrong, correct me. We did look at the E region neutral wind, but in general, the magnitude is much smaller than F region wind. Mm -hmm. uh, well, well, some perturbation definitely happened. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And then uh, maybe offline, but like, uh, I'm curious about your Ashley A model. Mm -hmm. How that compares to Ovation Prime, because uh, that's also from DMSP particle data, and then you probably have done some. That's a great question. Um, yeah, uh, the approach definitely is, uh, is different. And uh, Ovation assumes certain mm -hmm. spectrum, you know, four different kind of spectrum first, then get the uh, distribution, then merge it. It will be very interesting to compare uh, directly with Ovation, even, you know, both, model, um, both models are based on the same database, but use different approach and how different will the outcome is, well, well, that would be very interesting. We haven't done that, but definitely we should do that in the future. Hey, UA, thank you. Nice talk. I didn't know if we were using Slido for questions for this session. But uh, one of the questions was, I know you, you just showed the mesoscale E-field and how important it was. At a, sort of a 100 kilometer scale, was that your, was that your kind of scale size you're using for the super darn? Oh, that's a great question. Um, for the super darn, uh, probably I think Bill is a better person to address that question. Um, at the, the deep, we, we, we didn't really confirm any particular sp spatial scale yet. Uh, it is embedded in the methodology. Okay. So uh, for the master scale, you know, for the localized region, the resolution is half degree in latitude okay. and one degree in longitude. So uh, whatever it can be resolved, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, but can, cannot be resolved by the global, then we, we basically put it as a master scale. 
Uh, Thank you. I think we're going to see some talks about smaller scale stuff at 10 kilometer, one kilometer. And I'm wondering oh. if you've done any studies or if you plan any studies to look at those smaller scales and how much they contribute because it might be quite substantial. Oh, that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah. I, oh, that probably, Dirk, we'll be happy to, uh, do you want to have to address that question? How can we go to smaller scale? So, so um, we, we can't really address scales smaller than about 50 kilometers because of the, the data sampling. We do have a proposal in this, to NSF to enhance the equipment so that we can go to finer scales. So if you see Alan, tell him to fund it. <laughs> but we can get down to tens of kilometers. Ah, well, you have to have the, the data before you can get to the model. The data has to resolve like twice the scale you're going to model. So. And you, there's, you know, there's a, obviously a lot of energy there. So, you know, we really want to get the smaller scales. And that was Doug's point, that there is a lot of missing energy at the smaller scale. Wonderful, yeah. If we can gather the data, and then definitely we can do some theoretical experiment okay. using our model. I'll show this afternoon. Sure. I'll be there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, please share your screen. And ready when you are, I think. Okay. So that's all, that's all good, hopefully. Um, great. Uh, well, ho hopefully I'll be able to um, um, answer the last question about like really small scale stuff, and hopefully that doesn't hurt um, hurt Bill's proposal too much. Um, in the process of doing so. So I'll, I'll apologize in advance for that. Um, so this will uh, be a very general talk about some of the collaborative work uh, we've been doing over the last year, um, which has been focused on global scale pointing flux statistics. And um, we've been using data from Superdon, Ampere, and Swarm Satellite, which all have a lot of global data coverage over many years now. Um, so they're in a really great spot um, to use for statistics. Um, so pointing flux, is electromagnetic yeah, any tra energy transfer rate um, carried by field line currents uh, connecting magnetosphere and the ionosphere. That's this uh, S with the cool lightning bolt uh, right next to it. Um, pointing blocks can be calculated uh, using Poisson's theorem, where we need the perturbation of electric and magnetic fields. Um, the electric field is directly related to the ionospheric convection in the direction of the Peterson currents, um, which connects the field line currents together. And then the perturbation magnetic field is deviation from Earth's terrestrial magnetic field, um, which is caused by the field line currents themselves. Um, now, pointing flux isn't always into the ionosphere. Um, sometimes it comes from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere, um, i.e. upwards instead of downwards. And this happens, for instance, if the atmospheric neutral winds um, drive an ionospheric field instead of the magnetospheric convection. Um, most of the time, however, it's magnetosphere driving the ionosphere, so upward flux is uncommon and usually small compared to downward flux. Um, so firstly, what does the pointing flux do? Well, on the, on the large scale, which is what I'm mostly I'll be talking about, um, it travels along field line currents and then is deposited into the ionosphere almost entirely as dual heating. Um, so the heating drives things like um, uh, thermospheric upwelling, which then affects the density, notoriously in the cusp region. Uh, and it can also increase the ionospheric conductivity, 
which then strengthens ion neutral coupling, um, i.e., the collisions between the ions and neutrals, and then that can lead to enhanced atmospheric winds. Um, so ultimately, the pointing flux does a lot, and it's interconnected to most processes going on in the cobalt magnetosphere, ionosphere, thermosphere system. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be I'm going to show a bunch of statistics we're doing on pointing flux um, up at the University of Saskatchewan um, with data from Superdon, Amber, and Swarm. But I first want to highlight some of the recent statistics that's been done, um, which we're kind of standing on the shoulders of. Um, First, there's this realization that there's asymmetry between the pointing flux in the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, Knip Patel uh, showed this with DMSP statistics, and uh, so did Cosgrove Patel with uh, FAST data. And I think um, I think they're talking uh, in this afternoon, so I won't spoil too much of that. Um, the crux of that, though, is there's more pointing flux coming into the north than in the south probably because uh, conductivity differences between, uh, caused by magnetic pole offsets from the spin axis. Um, additionally, in this um, Nature Comms paper by uh, Pocotin Tal last year, um, they showed that when you observe larger and larger spatial scales, which is basically the x-axis on this plot, um, you observe less and less pointing flux. Um, that implies that the small scale electric field variability, um, possibly driven by alphane waves, is contributing pointing flux that you miss at a very large scale quasi static system. Okay, so um, onto what we've done. So, to calculate pointing flux, we need measurements of the electric and magnetic field. Um, we get electric field data um, in, this first, in this first case from Superdon, um, which is a network of HF radars in both hemispheres. So, each radar measures line of sight plasma velocity. Then you combine all the data together to get a global scale fit of the high latitude electric potential, um, which is the high latitude atmospheric convection pattern. Um, then the potential is related to the electric field and fitted velocities through these two familiar equations up here. So we can extract the electric field very easily on a global scale list, which is data driven. Um, so that's the electric field from Superon, and we need something similar. To do it globally, we need something similar for the perturbation magnetic field, which we get from Ampere. Um, Ampere utilizes magnetometers on board the Iridium constellation communication satellite, and it does a fitting similar to what um, sort of similar to what Superdon does. And then we get a global pattern of the um, perturbation magnetic fields. And many people use Ampere for the field line current uh, product, which is derived from the perturbation fields. Um, but obviously, we only need the perturbation fields for our pointing plus calculation. So we take an electric potential um, slash electric field pattern from Superdon. Um, we take the perturbation magnetic field pattern from Ampere, and then we plug them into um, Pointing's theorem, um, and we can get like a global instantaneous distribution of the pointing flux for whenever these this data is good for. So the resolution of the these Superdon convection maps are two minutes typically, and Ampere's ten minutes typically. So we can get like one of these every every two to ten minutes. Um, so that's obviously really good statistics because we can get a global snapshot every two to 10 minutes, which is really nice. Um, this is pretty straightforward to do, but there's a few things, um, kind of caveats, mainly that it's obviously global scale or quasi-static pointing flux. Um, so this method won't reveal pointing flux due to small scale alphanic stuff, which is driven by electric field variability, for example. Um, this is because that super non-convection pattern is obvious and the ampere pattern is a global scale fit. Um, which smooths out a lot of spatiotemporal variability, um, even though it's technically there in the data. However, this method's very good at picking out the large scale fluxes, which are driven by region one and two field line currents, for example, um, assuming the data going, going into it has decent coverage. Um, the other thing to note is um, uh, sometimes pointing flux can be negative, such as in the regions on this plot, um, which in the northern hemisphere means that pointing flux is direct directed upwards, um, which is connected to that atmospheric Daimler effect that I mentioned a little, uh, slightly earlier. Okay, so taking um, all the overlapping Superon and Ampere data, which is about 10 years worth currently, um, we can do some cool statistics with that. This, for example, is a superposed epoch analysis of IMF BZ transition. So it's a pretty boring thing to do, um, but it's kind of cool to show like the power of the data set, I guess. Um, so we've got BZ northward to southward transitions on the left, and then the reverse, which is southward to northward transitions on the right. Um, so 
the left one is uh, like activating your dungeon cycle, and the right one is like switching it off. And straight away, we see the superdown ampere method does a pretty good job at representing that large scale quasi static pointing flux where we expect the electric field to be high, for instance, in the cusp and in the field line current regions. Um, both of these uh, BZ transitions also do pretty much what you'd expect in that the pointing flux lights up in the field line current regions when the INF goes southward, and the opposite when it goes northward. The pointing flux drops off very quickly. Um, what's cool, though, is if you look very closely at both of these transitions, you can see the increase or decrease starts on the day side at T0 and then moves across to the night side, um, which makes sense because the IMF transition itself starts at magnetopause and then has to move across the polar cap with time. So that's very cool that we can pick that out in the statistical data. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. Um, so after looking at the super on and Ampere data using their very global scale data products. And uh, now we come to the swarm satellites. Um, these are a constellation of three satellites, A, B, and C, um, which have electric and magnetic field instruments that can give a sample rate of 16 hertz and 50 hertz, respectively. Um, taking into account the satellite velocity, that's about a one kilometer scale size on the 16 hertz measurement. And then we can downsample the magnetic field data to get onto the same resolution. So this one kilometer scale size is uh, much smaller, obviously, than what super non ampere bits can reasonably resolve. Um, so here's an example of some electric field data from Swarm A, um, 16 hertz. It's only three minutes worth of data going over the aurora zone. Um, but even in this relatively small window, you can see that there's a lot of electric field variability embedded with some, some large scale structures. So with this high res data set, we wanted to quantify how much extra pointing flux is actually in the electric field variability at the small scales, um, which correspond to around about a kilometer. Um, so if we want to extract the pointing flux caused by electric field variability, first we should subtract the background electric field that's caused by the large scale convection. We do that by just simply uh, subtracting a very long low pass filtered version of the data set. And then when we have delta E, we can play around with varying low pass filter sizes to want to officially smooth out data to larger and larger scale sizes. Um, for example, if we use a um, around about a 10 second filter on the 16 hertz data, we're effectively smoothing out the spatial scale to about 150 kilometers. So then this plot on the right um, shows the whole process in practice. Um, it's the same swarm A example from the previous slide, and the colors on these curves represent uh, the low pass filtered um, that we've applied to artificially increase the scale size, and the gray is just the unfiltered 16 hertz data. So we use delta E and uh, delta B, with del uh, delta E is much more del uh, variable than delta B, to calculate the pointing flux, which is plotted in this fourth panel down. Um, and then the bottom panel shows the pointing flux when it's cumulatively integrated with time. So from this very last panel, we can see that we're not just smoothing out pointing flux by using the filters I mentioned, but we're actually measuring less of it when we look at larger and larger scale sizes. Um, the unfiltered late data, which is the gray line here, shows the largest total amount of integrated flux, um, while we get less and less as the scale size increases. So this variability in the unfiltered small scale data is therefore not just noise, it's actually integrating to more energy entering the atmosphere in total. So let me go ahead and do some statistics with the swarm derived pointing flux. So here on the left is Northern Hemisphere statistics sorted by IMF um, for the unfiltered 16 hertz data set. And we see that the pointing flux enhancement regions are basically aligned with the regions where the convection electric field is most variable. I, it's like a, around the cusp and around midnight. Um, we also see very fairly typical BY and BZ asymmetries causing a kind of rotation um, between the dawn and dusk, as well as just being more uh, variable under southward IMF. Um, this plot on the right is what happens if we do the statistics um, with all those uh, low pass filtered data sets to increase the scale size. So this is increasing scale size as we go down. And we see the pointing flux everywhere just drops when we observe larger and larger scale sizes. Um, if we um, say that spatial resolution of the superarm fitted convection patterns that's on the order of a few hundred kilometers. Um, then we see that we're missing several gigawatts worth of integrated energy at those scales compared to the very smaller scales. 
Um, now, these plots emphasize how the hemisphere integrated point inverts drops off with increasing spatial scale size um, by applying those low pass filters I've talked about. Um, the colors on this are different IMF orientations and the solid lines uh, are statistics for downward pointing flux and the dashed lines are statistics for upward pointing flux. So this top plot um, shows the decrease in the integrated flux magnitude with scale. And this one's pretty straightforward um, as it just shows the pointing flux continuously decreasing with increasing scale for all IMF orientations and for both downward and upward pointing flux. Um, if you look closely, however, um, you'll see at very small scales, which are highlighted in blue, the curve is a little bit steeper. Um, the second plot down now uh, shows the pointing flux as a percentage of the smaller scale size. So you can see the percentage drop in pointing flux as the scale increases. And here we can see that in accelerated pointing flux drop um, at small scales much more clearly. Um, and when we get to the very largest scale sizes, uh, about 1,000 kilometers here, um, we're underestimating the pointing flux by about 50%. This very bottom plot is the same as the middle one, except I've just zoomed into the very smallest scales. So between um, about one kilometer and about 60 kilometers. And this one's very important because it shows that we underestimate the pointing flux by tens of percent just at these small scales um, when we don't take into account the electric field, electric field variability. So going from unfiltered data down to about 60 kilometers, we underestimate downward pointing flux by about 10% and upward pointing flux by over 20%. And this is huge um, considering the spatial resolution of a lot of instruments, including Subanon, and we're, even if we just look at the um, straight radar data as it stands now, typically that comes at about a 45 kilometer resolution. You can get lower than that. Typically it's 45. So this, um, this is quite a large underestimation and it applies to just a lot of different instruments. Um, this is uh, not a warning, but more of a friendly poke that uh, a lot of instruments could miss a lot of pointing flux. Okay, so um, very quickly, I'll just go on to the um, very last thing that we've kind of been looking at. Uh, we started directly comparing the pointing flux that Swarm was giving us um, with that from what Supernon and Ampere was giving us. Um, Swarm, we uh, now know, can see all the small scale stuff, which um, might be caused by alphanic electric field variability. While Supernon and Ampere is very good at picking out the quasi-static big picture stuff. So this on the left is what happens when we derive pointing flux statistically from swarm with the full electric field vector, so not the perturbation delta E this time. And then this on the right is the equivalent pattern for super and statistics. And the keen eye will see that these two don't actually look very close to each other at all. Super R1 has clear enhancements in the field and current regions, and the swarm one is enhanced basically everywhere. However, if we think of that full electric field vector that swarm observes, as having two components, one which is caused by that uh, alphanic electric field variability at very small scales, and one which is caused by the large-scale quasi-static convection, then what we can do is subtract the perturbation pointing flux, which is calculated using delta E, uh, from the full pointing flux, which is calculated using the full E, and then if uh, we've made our assumptions correctly, then what we should be left with um, is just the quasi-static pointing flux. And that's exactly what we've done here. So this is perturbation pointing flux, um, the full pointing flux, and then the difference between the two. Um, and then I've put the supernon ampere pattern in the top right, and you can see that um, uh, these two, this swarm difference plot and this supernon ampere plot, those line up uh, much nicer with each other. Um, so what, what this tells us is Supernon Ampere isn't very good at picking up small, small scale stuff right now if you use the fitted products, which is a very obvious thing to say, um, but this process kind of approves it. Um, and importantly, this, uh, this pretty simple technique seems to imply that we can in fact separate the alphanic and the quasi-static driven pointing flux components. Um, essentially, it means we might be able to bridge the gap between the small and large scale pointing flux dynamics. Um, so that's it for me. I'm not sure if I'm over time or not, but um, I'll just kind of leave this um, summary plot up there, and then I'll take any questions if we've got time, or you can send me an email if we haven't. That's fine, too.
Thank you very much, Dan. Seems to imply in a quasi static. Uh, very nice talk. It's, it's tremendous to see the swarm E and B. Um, my question is, when you use the swarm electric field data, did you use the vector or just one component of the electric field? Um, so it was, it, was a, it was a little hard to hear, but I think you asked, um, do I use the full vector or just one component? We use the full vector. OK, great. I have a follow-up question on the swarm. Um, I, there's been some concerns about the uh, ion drifts there. Um, did you do anything to address the, the data quality? Uh, to address the quality of the ion drifts? Um, uh, short answer, um, no. Uh, so the, this, this 16 hertz data set has recently um, kind of been um, reprocessed, I think it was reprocessed in 2020. Uh, and there is some validation based on that um, from um, our colleagues at the University of Calgary as well. So we're kind of, we're trusting, we're trusting their word and work on that. Um, and there is some uh, data quality, there's there's quite a, a lot of data quality facts with this um, 16 hertz data as well. Um, so we're utilizing those and we're only using what those data quality flags say as good data. Okay, thank you. Um, would it be fair to say you didn't find the, the 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 smallest scale that matters? It seemed that it was increasing even to the smaller scales in terms of the pointing flux. Sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, uh, it seems the pointing flux was still increasing towards the smallest scales that you could measure. Is that mm -hmm. fair? Uh, are, are you um, are you talking about like a, like a kind of diminishing returns kind of thing where if we get smaller and smaller we'll just see more and more? Yeah, I'm asking if if there might be even smaller scales than you you were able to observe. Um, yeah, so there's kind of so I'm, I'm hesitant to say that it will just keep going up and up um, as you get smaller and smaller because then you, you're you're, we're already kind of like approaching the limit where we expect um, alpha waves to like have an impact on the electric field variability. So um, I'm not really sure like how much this will keep going up. Um, though I wouldn't expect it to be much past like a, a one kilometer scale size. Though it could be could be a little bit more. So brief comment about using swarm electric field data. So first of all, it's very important when using this data to keep track of the flex that are provide, provided with the data set. And next, uh, uh, cross-track drift measurements are much, much more reliable than along track drift measurements that translates in the reliability of electric field components as well. So yeah, this is one thing to watch carefully when using swarm data. I couldn't really make that out. Sorry, it was very muffled. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, not sure if that was I think it, I think a question here is uh, uncertainty, right? I mean, so that's the quality of um, swarm data set, plasma drift data versus electric field data. And then also I have a question about use of Ampere product and then Superdam product to estimate pointing flux. It's a, it's a very difficult to fold in uncertainty into the estimation. I mean, just in general, I think, uh, and also GDC is coming up and then potential to measure pointing flux, uh, follow up on this, uh, all the questions that we coming up here. And I, I really want the audience and the speakers to hold that question on, uh, I guess uh, people are interested in scales and also we're getting different measurements and telling us different story on how to bring this together moving forward. So hold, Please hold your questions so that we have a good discussion for the white paper writing. Uh, I think the next speaker is going to be Andre Demikov. Uh, if, Andre, if could, you could share your your screen. Hi, yep. can you hear me? Yep. 
Uh, Alex, can you share? Can you show my presentation, please? Because I am unable to share uh, from my screen. Yeah. Yes, please. And I will probably start talking. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm happy to uh, present uh, my results. And I have to say that they are slightly or you no know, slightly off topic uh, for this session. Uh, also, they, uh, they do deal with pointing flux, but it is pointing flux in the magnetosphere, and it is pointing flux of Whistler mode, chorus waves. Uh, so uh, uh, you will see uh, how we, how this uh, how measurements of pointing flux of uh, uh, low frequency Whistler mode waves can be significant for uh, checking uh, for checking the uh, model of uh, Cross wave generation. So, will we be able to see the screen? Oh yes, yes, uh, it is here. Uh, uh, next, next slide, please. Can you please move to the next slide? At the moment, I'm seeing only uh, the title slide. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing just the title title page, title slide. Yeah, on the on the webcast. On the webcast, it seems that uh, only title page. Yes. Ah, okay. 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 Uh, and now, it's already. Uh, it's already fifth or, yeah, so, so this is the outline. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, this is just a summary. And now let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, so in fact, uh, the first, uh, uh, let's see what is chorus emissions. Maybe some of you, or maybe many of you know. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, one to 10 kilohertz waves, uh, electromagnetic. Uh, Whistler mode, and uh, I will be uh, uh, dealing with CIMIS mission data obtained in burst mode, where we have uh, uh, three uh, magnetic and three electric field components with uh, about 80 kilohertz uh, sample frequency. And uh, this data uh, in this uh, VLF frequency range show us uh, from time to time, uh, quite often actually, these uh, chorus emissions as discrete elements with fast frequency drift. Uh, I will show more uh, later, and now next slide. Uh, so uh, why it is significant? Uh, these chorus emissions are first of all a very interesting nonlinear phenomenon. Uh, because uh, it's example of quasi-monochromatic wave packets generated under natural conditions. Uh, it's a true nonlinear process, which uh, and nonlinearity ensures fast frequency drift and complex frequency time structures. Uh, the mechanism of this uh, nonlinear phenomenon is still under study, and uh, just uh, some incomplete list of papers till the uh, recent, till the last years. Uh, Maybe uh, more importantly for practice is that these uh, chorus waves uh, play a very important role in energetic particle dynamics. They first, uh, uh, they can energize electrons up to several mega electron volts and actually they are considered as an important agents, agent in producing radiation belts, uh, outer radiation belt. But uh, on the other side, on the other hand, uh, chorus uh, produces a precipitation of energetic electrons into the ionosphere. 
And this effect on energetic particles is nonlinear and complicated. So it's also uh, under study. Uh, next slide uh, is discussing a possible relevance uh, of this topic for this pointing flux section, session. And uh, this is kind of exotic for, uh, for this audience, probably example showing significant on, of pointing flux uh, because these waves are generated in the near equatorial region of the magnetosphere. Uh, pointing flux is uh, bidirectional in the generation region and actually it doesn't show uh, pre uh, preferred direction uh, near the equator. And what I will be talking about in the rest of the time, I will show you that uh, knowing uh, the preferable uh, or predominant pointing flux direction, we can compare the measurement location with respect to the geomagnetic equator. Uh, and the geomagnetic equator is now considered the position of a local uh, minimum of the magnetic field. And this uh, can actually be deviated uh, quite strongly from the nominal equator because uh, we will be in the outer magnetosphere uh, for L up to six, up to seven. Uh, and what we may find, uh, we find a systematic change in the wave frequency depending on the shift of the measurement point with respect to this equator. And this uh, systematic change is not so uh, big, but it's uh, quite significant. And interestingly, the similar variation is obtained in our theoretical model. Uh, let's go further. Next slide, please. So these are two examples of CMIS data. Uh, and uh, the screen is divided actually horizontally into uh, parts uh, for two events. They are indicated, their date, date, uh, uh, dates are indicated uh, by blue. And what can you see? Uh, uh, the spectrograms uh, show you uh, the uh, pointing flux, actually, the model of, uh, modules of the pointing flux. And you can see that it is 10 to minus 6 milliwatt per meter square per hertz. So for the bandwidth of about uh, several hundreds of hertz, uh, it is still much smaller pointing flux uh, compared to what the previous uh, reporter uh, has discussed. <laughs> so uh, in these terms, these are not so significant uh, uh, phenomena, but uh, they actually influence to the ionosphere and thermosphere system uh, via precipitation of energetic electrons. Uh, and these electrons influence uh, actually the chemistry of the uh, upper and middle atmosphere. Uh, so the value of the pointing flux is here much smaller, but uh, the direction is quite significant. And the direction of pointing flux is shown uh, uh, on uh, uh, bottom panels, bottom sub panels of each of these panels. And you see uh, red uh, elements with uh, pointing flux directed counter to the uh, background magnetic field and blue elements uh, which pointing flux is directed uh, uh, parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, uh, then uh, if you see, uh, compare the uh, upper and bottom uh, panel for uh, the two events, then uh, they seem to be uh, uh, different or even opposite because in the upper panel, you can see that blue, blue uh, elements have higher frequencies uh, than red elements. And uh, on the bottom event, it's, it's, it's up vice versa. So uh, red elements have slightly higher frequency than uh, compared to bottom, uh, uh, to, to, to to blue elements. Uh, however, if we compare uh, the direction of the pointing flux to the position of the spacecraft with respect to uh, minimum B field, then uh, both uh, events uh, become to be similar, in fact. 
because in both cases, uh, higher frequencies, higher frequency wave packets uh, go uh, in the direction towards the equator, and lower frequency wave packets uh, go away from the equator. Uh, maybe it's uh, no time to uh, this, um, describe it in detail, uh, but in fact, the upper, the, the right panels uh, show you the positions of the spacecraft uh, to the uh, magnetic uh, field minimum. And uh, uh, for example, in the right bottom panel, you can see uh, that Timis is uh, northward of the B minimum. And this means that uh, blue elements go, in fact, to the, th to, uh, the spacecraft. And this means that they go away from the equator. Uh, so uh, this uh, is summarized below in the slide that weaker and higher frequency elements propagate towards the equator. Uh, they are indeed weaker, as you can see in total uh, power, in total power spectrograms. And uh, the next slide, please. Uh, these uh, plots show uh, that uh, indeed uh, uh, elements going to the equator are weaker than those goes, uh, going from the equator. And uh, on the other hand, the uh, exponential growth phase uh, has uh, similar uh, values of the growth rate. And this uh, implies that they uh, originate from the same source. Uh, so uh, we can go to the next slide now. And uh, we selected, uh, actually my colleague uh, Uli, Uli Talbenschus selected uh, totally about uh, 150 events uh, uh, observed uh, within the uh, within several thousand kilometers from the magnetic equator, and uh, then uh, selected most uh, clear events, uh, amounted to 100, about 100 cases around rising tone cores. And this diagram uh, summarizes the properties of weaker and higher frequency chorus elements with respect uh, to uh, the position of the spacecraft uh, relative to the magnetic equator. And uh, uh, we see that uh, in all, actually in all uh, those cases which are plotted here, uh, weaker and higher frequency chorus elements uh, go, uh, go to the equator. So they, uh, they go along the magnetic field. If, we, they are if the spacecraft is left of the equator and they go against uh, the magnetic field if the spacecraft is uh, right from the equator. So actually, uh, this uh, uh, fact uh, seems universal. And now uh, we just uh, try to check uh, how it can be explained by model. Uh, next slide, maybe I will show you quicker. So this is a scheme. Uh, so you see the B minimum and uh, CIMIS uh, spacecraft uh, sees a, a stronger element goes uh, from the equator, where the center of the source region is expected to be, and uh, the elements, weaker and higher frequency elements, uh, go, in this case, to the equator uh, from the edge of the expected source region. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, just a summary of the model, uh, of some, some properties of the model uh, and uh, actually, uh, if we see uh, the picture, it tells you that according to the model, uh, porous is generated by uh, absolute instability, uh, which means uh, that these electromagnetic waves uh, grow near the equator in the absence of any uh, reflection of these waves from any uh, mirror, from any inhomogeneity. And this uh, means that the instability is absolute. It can occur uh, because uh, resonant electrons go uh, oppositely to the waves they uh, resonate with. And if this feedback is deep enough, then the instability can become absolute. 
maybe it's uh, no time to show a more detail of this model. Next slide. Uh, next slide is significant because, uh, yes, this one, uh, because it explains uh, the frequency drift of the chorus waves uh, uh, by sideband instability. So uh, nonlinearly trapped energetic particles uh, 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 form form a bunch, and uh, uh, during this trapping, the uh, distribution function is modified. So the initial uh, region of the instability in the velocity space uh, is uh, stabilized, but uh, uh, the uh, gradient of the distribution function in the velocity space moves moves to the neighbor region. And this process occurs on a time scale, which can be estimated uh, by uh, the amplitude of the uh, uh, magnetic field, electromagnetic field, uh, and the amount of the shift is also uh, depending on the same uh, time scale. And then we can uh, uh, obtain the estimate of the frequency drift. What is important, and it is shown on the next slide, this show, that this picture is special temporal. So electrons uh, are modified while moving along the uh, source region. And then uh, any uh, uh, next element, any next part of the element with the uh, changing frequency is generated on the next uh, position. So on the uh, space time diagram, uh, you see that one frequency is generated in the beginning uh, of the source region, and then uh, uh, electrons move uh, further and further to the right and generate high and high frequencies according to the scheme. And next slide. So uh, this is just a brief summary of the um, equations which we can solve numerically. And then uh, the next slide will show uh, some results, I guess. Uh, so first, uh, just we test the model that it can indeed produce uh, the chorus elements numerically. Uh, uh, here you see that uh, we can obtain correct uh, growth rates. And the uh, next slide will show that we can obtain also discrete elements with uh, frequency drift, uh, uh, mostly rising tones in our simulations, but also some falling tone part can be detected here. And also it can be seen in the observations. And the uh, next slide, uh, okay, this one, yes. And uh, this slide shows that the picture is indeed different uh, downstream and upstream from the center of the generation region. So downstream, uh, the elements are stronger and they have lower frequencies than uh, upstream. Uh, this is for one uh, wave particle system. Uh, in this case, uh, electrons move uh, to the left and waves uh, move uh, to the right. If we uh, remember or recall, recall that in fact there are also electrons moving to the right and waves moving to the left, so we, we will have two subsystems uh, generated, uh, generating uh, oppositely propagating waves. Uh, this uh, uh, process, uh, uh, both uh, waves propagate in the same region, and if we superimpose, superimpose these two pictures, uh, having uh, on the one uh, on the one side of the equator, the next slide will show us uh, this summary. Summary, and uh, uh, indeed we will have uh, stronger elements with lower frequencies uh, that uh, are superimposed on weaker elements uh, with higher frequencies. If, yes, in this picture is uh, actually uh, quite a uh, kind of universal. And this corresponds, uh, it corresponds well to uh, what uh, Simis has seen uh, for these uh, selected uh, events. Uh, next slide probably repeats the same, just for, for another event. And next slide. 
uh, just uh, kind of trying to explain what we see uh, again uh, coming back to qualitative picture of element formation and again uh, we see that a special special temporal uh, uh, nature of this generation uh, mechanism uh, is quite important here so in this case particles moving to the left and waves moving to the right and this uh, part of any element with frequencies from f0 to f6 are generated effectively uh, at different positions and they form uh, uh, they form uh, the elements uh, with different frequencies depending on the position of the observation uh, spacecraft. Uh, so that's basically uh, what, I, what I wanted to tell. Uh, probably the next slide will be, will be some conclusions. Let's, let's look on the next slide. Ah, ah, so there are no conclusions in my presentation, oh. really? Uh, I'm, I'm also surprised. Uh, I'm pressing down, uh, there's a move. Interesting. Sorry. Yeah, that seems to be the last slide. Uh, in my draft slide, in my draft presentation. Uh, but if we, go, if we go now to the third uh, slide from the beginning, I guess uh, actually what I have uh, told in the introduction, so next, oh no, yeah, next one. Yes, actually the results which I wanted to present are, are kind of summarized here. So we find some systematic change in the wave frequency depending on the shift of the measurement point with respect to the equator. And the similar variation is obtained in our uh, both in a numerical model, and we can also understand it uh, uh, qual qualitatively. So uh, this is this is the essence of the talk. Compared, uh, and again, I just come back to the ionosphere-thermosphere region. Uh, these pointing boxes are quite low; uh, that are carried by um, Wister mode waves, and also by energetic electrons that precipitate into the uh, ionosphere. However, these are quite uh, significant. Uh, 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 facts that they precipitate because uh, these energetic electrons just influence the uh, thermospheric uh, and the middle atmospheric chemistry, uh, especially in rural and uh, uh, partly in suburural regions. So thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Andre? I have a question. Uh, what you're showing, uh, have you seen any uh, hemispheric asymmetry in, uh, in these waves uh, in Themis? Uh, we've seen some previous presentations indicating uh, asymmetries in the ionospheric pointing flux. So does the source show that? Yeah, I, yes, I, I understand your question. And uh, uh, I would say, uh, first of all, no, uh, because uh, uh, these measurements, all of them are made uh, within uh, uh, a narrow region uh, near the uh, equatorial B minimum uh, point. Uh, so, statistically, uh, there would be no asymmetry in this region. Uh, uh, no, 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 not, not exactly this, but uh, actually, there is not so big statistics, and uh, I wouldn't expect uh, too uh, great uh, asymmetry because, uh, because these coarse waves are generated independently on the ionosphere. They are ge generated uh, just near the equatorial region, which is more or less symmetric near the B minimum. Uh, it is only shifted from the nominal equator but it's maybe not so significant. If you go to maybe somewhat weaker uh, VLF waves that are generated in the entire flux tube, they can be asymmetric, yes. And uh, we can see uh, different intensities of VLF waves in different, in, in opposite uh, hemispheres. 
if they are generated uh, with the participation, with possible participation of the reflected from the ionosphere. And in this case, yes, uh, the asymmetry is expected, and uh, sometimes we see uh, uh, facts that uh, witness such an asymmetry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is Gang Lu. So, uh, well, uh, yeah, okay, sure, no problem. So the title, as shown here, um, is a point flux dual heating and the energy dissipation in the IT system. So I have to um, say that what I'm talking about today is the focus on the largest scale, which is 100 kilometers or larger. Um, maybe I'm uh, preaching to choir here, but I do want to remind it everyone what this pointing theorem is about. So, so that's the pointing uh, theorem equations, um, the, basically the energy com conservation formula. So when, for the static uh, um, conditions, then the first part, first term is uh, going to, can be ignored, and you're, you're left with this term. That's what the general pointing, flux, uh, pointing theorem is referring to, basically people focusing on the pointing flux uh, versus the energy uh, um, dissipation or generation term. However, if you look at it here, it's the divergence of the pointing flux, not the directional pointing flux itself is associated with the energy dissipation or generation. So if you have the converging pointing flux, that means J dot E is positive. This is means electromagnetic energy converting to kinetic energy, so it's energy sink. However, if it's divergence um, pointing flux, then J dot E is negative, and this gives you the energy generator. Um, so, okay. And Art Richmond further uh, pointed out in his 2010 paper that shows, that explained that what is downward pointing flux, which so many people off in the field just say that's the energy generator, you know, energy term. And it, However, he pointed out that downward pointing flux does not uh, often can underestimate electromagnetic dissipation in regions of high conductance, and, but overestimate it in the uh, low conductance region. So you have to be careful uh, what did the downward pointing flux value means in terms of energy dissipation. And the local um, upward pointing flux does not necessarily mean it's uh, there's a generator in the, uh, in the ionosphere for EN, uh, ENMM energy. Only at certain conditions, downward flux, integrated downward flux can be referring to, is, is associated with the energy dissipation. That is, if the volume of the ionosphere is bounded by equal potential um, from size and by the bottom, uh, at the base of the conducting ionosphere, um, then in such a case, then the, the the integrated energy, uh, down, uh, area integration of downward flux, uh, pointing flux that equals energy dissipation within that volume. So if you are interested, I highly recommend you read this paper uh, to understand what exactly, uh, what he has talked about here. Uh, okay, so um, again, so uh, for this talk, I'll be just focusing on this one specific event um, just to illustrate how the relationship between pointing flux and uh, uh, dual heating. So this is well known, um, St. Patrick Day storm, 2015. So I will focus on three particular time, UT times. Uh, one is strongly northward, uh, IMF uh, at 5.30 UT. Uh, you can see that um, this is also associated with uh, com uh, the magnetic sheet compression. So you have a positive phase, the storm southern commencement. And this is before the major activity starts. Then the 14 UT, uh, when the, B, the A index is the largest, the strongest, and you have a southward BZ and the very strong BY. Then near the peak of the uh, major uh, main, main phase of the storm at 22 UT, you have a smaller BY and uh, also 
constant busy over several hours. So that's just for illustration purpose here. Okay, so here is the distribution on the top for the three times for the uh, corresponding to the different col columns here. The top row shows the dew heating, height integrated dew heating. The bottom panel showing the pointing flux, downward pointing flux is positive. Uh, you can see some regions, actually the minimum, sometimes I don't know whether you can see the bottom, the small font, sorry about that. Um, it's negative value, so in some local regions, it does have a upward pointing flux as well, but it's a small magnitude. Okay, so now let's look at the, basically at the 530 northward MF, and you have the energy dissipation mostly on the day side, which is not surprising. I'll also note that the color scales are different. So for the northward, it's about half of the magnitude for the south compared to the to other southward MF conditions. And this is the uh, highest uh, aurora activity with the, with the at least with the largest the A index, and you see very much enhanced both dual heating and uh, pointing flux. And this is the relative steady MF at the you near know, the main phase of the storm. So if you're comparing the top row with the bottom row and the first impression, they are very close. Yes, indeed, most times downward pointing flux is dissipated in the, in the, uh, as a dual heating. But the, if you look at the total magnitude, sometimes they are not. Ex they, uh, well, overall, especially during north, um, southward cases, in the northward they are probably one gigawatts off, but I think it's probably because I'm only keeping the integers, not the... So they are basically essentially the same for this case, uh, for the for the northward case, and for the southward MF cases, and the um, dew heating, uh, the hemisphere integrated dew heating is a smaller than hemisphere downward, uh, 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 the pointing flux. Also, the local maximum are different, and sometimes in some locations here, in the the dark spots, maybe you cannot see as well. So, sorry. Again, I'm apologizing for the scale and the, the, the fonts, um, not, probably not too visible from the back of the room. Uh, so what I'm trying to say, illustrate here is downward the point, uh, point for us does the most majority of the time is dissipating as a dual heating, but it's not exactly one to one. They are the same, exactly the same. Uh, okay, okay, so another, another important point I want to make, although Point flux is carried by field run current. However, point flux does not directly align with the distribution of the field run current. Um, instead, they are usually, think about the wire current. Point flux actually point toward the wire rather than along the wire. Um, so what I'm showing here, oh, sorry, back. Um, the top row is again the same, same, uh, same image. Um, um, the dual heating, but I also overplot the convection contours. Um, so you can uh, for the for the dual heating, essentially dual heating is because of sigma p times e square. So it is the pretty much determined most time is determined by the intensity of the electric field or the interval of the contours. So the higher uh, dual heat dissipation, if you can see that most time they are is in the region where the contours are closest. And for the bottom, I overplot the field on current. Here, the dashed contours, the upward current, and the sort of the contours are downward currents. So for the northward MF cases, you have a three pair of a current sheet on the day side. And if you look carefully, um, again, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid that probably the back row cannot really see the contour very, very well. But uh, in general, they are lined between the downward and upward currents instead of the, along the on upward currents because this is downward, upward, downward, and these are the, at the boundary between downward and upward currents. And also um, for the northward cases, yeah, the strength is be, straddled between downward and current with the center around the separation between downward and currents. Okay, so I hope that I get the points crossed here. Um, so after you have the energy dissipating in the ionosphere, atmosphere system, what happens is the system uh, actually is further divided into several terms. This is J dot E, the dissipation or generation terms. Um, B 
becomes uh, J dot E prime. Prime is the electric field in the neutral wind frame. So this, this is the term usually people call the dew heating term. And another term is going to the mechanical work done by the neutral wind on the plasma, uh, plasma medium. Depends which one is driving which. You can get negative or positive terms. Um, so the, the, the dew heating can also separate in the neutral wind frame. You have the uh, e, sigma E dot, e, uh, sigma P E square. That's basically the heating a term we lots of people using as in the Amy, which I showed earlier, that it totally ignore the neutral wind. Then this is the, what the dew heating look like. So in the, for this purpose, I've just called them, uh, called this term the convection heating. Then the other terms are associated with the neutral wind. So I name it as a wind heating. However, because of the neutral wind uh, tend to be the magnet, the neutral wind flow tend to be smaller than E cross B drift. So in general, this term is negative. Um, the only so only times that you can uh, get a uh, so this is actually I call the heating is actually the cooling effect in terms of you know, uh, compensated the heating um, by the convection flow. Um, but however, so. Uh, However, if you have a neutral wind flow in a different direction as the ions, then this term can be become uh, larger than that. So that's the only case you get a negative uh, term. Uh, uh, so, no, I'm sorry. So you get to get a positive term to add this together when, when these, um, if the wind and the drift in the different direction, you, you may get a positive results from here. Okay, so. So these are the, again the the, uh, the times we uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the uh, three times 530 UT northward MF and the 14 UT and 22 UT corresponding southward MF. Um, so the the, um, the the vectors here are the ion drift and the vector for the wind term uh, wind heating term is the neutral wind at the e in the E region. Um, so. So in general, you see the, uh, the most time the, the, the term, the wind heating term is indeed the negative, and the mechanical power is a sort of opposite effect with the uh, wind heating term. But you add this together, in general, you still get a negative term. So the total uh, heating, dew heating is decreased because of the presence of neutral wind, or the energy dissipation due, due to the presence of neutral wind. And the, for, for the active times, you all similar things. Uh, then this is a very complex heating terms, and the, the, the here's the wind heating terms. And if you look at the carefully, where the heating or cooling uh, in, is happening is when where the the drift the ion drift is very strong, and the neutral wind are dragged by the ion drift, and that they end up actually reduce the total heating effect. And the mechanical power is a positive, and these two add up is overall give you a negative effects. And similarly for the 22 UT time cases. Okay. So, uh, well, and in addition to the heating, um, neutral wind also have an important influence on the field on current as well. So um, these are the. Three times again, the top uh, the 1530 UT, 14 UT, and 22 UT. The top low is the dew heating, uh, not field on current driven by the ion drift, and the bottom is the component uh, driven by the neutral wind, field on current driven by neutral wind. So note that the color scale by the order of difference between um, drift driven currents and the wind driven currents. Um, and if you're comparing the uh, contours, again, the, basically the red colors or dashed contours are upward and, uh, well, it's actually a plot of sort of. So the red colors are upward current and the blue colors are downward currents. Um, so you compare it, usually the wind uh, driven currents is up, flow in the opposite direction um, compared with the ion drift. So the net effect, again, the wind is reduced the intensity of your current. But it's their magnitude is much smaller, uh, roughly an order of magnitude smaller. But their um, the the wind 
driven current tend to be distributed more broadly in, in regions, um, so spread out a little bit more. Okay, that comes, comes to my conclusion slide, <laughs> sort of. So I basically summarizing uh, the wind effect uh, in, uh, on the energy dissipation and the fear and current. The top row is uh, different terms of energy dissipation uh, into the ionosphere. Um, the red line, dash line, is the heating without neutral wind. And the green dash line is the wind heating. It's actually, it's always negative. These are all hemisphere integrated magnitude uh, I'm uh, plotting here. And the mechanical power is also offset. Uh, it's generally positive um, for these particular events. And uh, then the total energy dissipation, which is the black, so it's slightly smaller than the, the uh, convection heating. Uh, and the middle panel shows the fear on current intensity, again, hemisphere uh, integrated magnitude. Um, by the uh, the total field on current and the versus the field on current driven by ion drift. So the difference between these two are the wing, uh, neutral wing effect on the field on current. So the bottom basically uh, plot out the contribution of the neutral wind to uh, field, to, uh, to the uh, dew heating and the field on current. Um, so overall, you can see that they vary a little bit over the these um, storm intervals, but in general, about 19% um, reduction for dew heating and about 16% uh, reduction for fuel run current. Again, I have to uh, clarify, those are really depends on the, the events that you're looking at for different IMF orientations, for different um, you know, background, the season conditions, the neutral contribution might be different. Okay, so that's all, thank you. Thank you. A any questions from the room? To Gan? I have one. So Gan, thank you for putting this um, talk together and then great overview. And then I have a question about scales. So what kind of scales that you are um, actually targeting? And then, okay. then with that, and, then, and also integrating over height and a hemisphere. So what we're going to learn, because there's other people talking about mesoscales, small scales, regional, and then I wonder if you have so, something to, um, to, to sort of challenge the community. That yeah, I have to admit, I have not looked into um, any mesoscale, small scale uh, contribution. I'm, I'm sure this is very important. But uh, what I'm showing here are results from Amy, the first two. So uh, Amy basically is about 150 kilometers in the larger scale, and for this, the uh, GCM simulation are using 1.25 resolution, so it's also about 150 kilometers. That's how. So that's the skill size determined, and the plus the additional average is small thing. So I'm talking about several hundred kilometers and the larger. So I cannot really see anything about the, the small scale, but the, because it, neither in the input forcing and the, in the GCM itself can reflecting how the mass of scale um, contribution would be. This. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, but. From audience? From Zoom? Anyone? Okay, let's thank Gan again. Thank you. So, um, please do not leave yet. And uh, we want to switch to, um, uh, yeah, let's, you know, thank you very much for everyone who gave our excellent talk today. And then for everyone being here. And then um, I'm taking over because Alex has to step away. And then uh, myself uh, as a co-convener, and then uh, uh, Sunny is a co-convener, and then uh, I think there, Bill, yeah, Bill, 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 could you, so there, I think uh, Gareth, you are co-convener too. Okay, you, anyone who listed, come, come in front and help. So, so as everybody know, white paper writing is coming up. And then GDC mission is coming up. And then, and then we are very exciting future that in the near future that we can target uh, some of the pressing questions regarding pointing flags. And uh, we start putting this document together. So this is a grand challenge workshop. So for a few years, we start collecting this information from the community. So uh, I think Subani was 
what you are, well, we, we are, we, we, this is a live document and a projected, and uh, I wanna, I want, you know, you to actually help us to, ho hopefully, you know, you're gonna write your own white papers, but also we want the, uh, this, you know, we wanna create this place of forum so that we can discuss, uh, so that we, get, we have good white papers, so that we can keep pushing this. And then if you have a few more things to say, Joe. I guess I'm not really sure what to say when I'm just handed a microphone. But um, so, uh, you know, from my point of view, you know, white papers are going to you know, motivate what kinds of instruments we're going to be building and or enhancements to the current instrumentation. And you know, so if there are things that we would like to see to push your individual research forward. That should be what goes in here. So, yeah, uh, not much more to add than Bill. What Bill said there. I know there is. There was a white paper workshop on ground-based instrumentation, and I think there was some papers there that people were uh, putting together about pointing flux. Um, and I don't know if we can get that up to coordinate ourselves, but I would encourage people to sign up for those um, if, that's, uh, if that's a help. I don't have my laptop on me, so I don't have that link. So I don't have that uh, particular link you're referring to, Gareth, but I, I recalled from our Grand Challenge um, workshop last year at CEDAR, we created a uh, uh, community contributed uh, Google document, so hopefully everybody should be able to share it. I just shared the link for people participating online um, through the chat. Is this what is being projected here? Okay. so. Um, that is available, and um, I think we had a number of sort of potential discussion topics uh, that had come up as themes both last year's workshop and this year's workshop. So I, so that, yeah, since we have a group of people, and then I want us to go over this, and then if you want to contribute, and then you are actually writing a white papers. This is a great place to um, sort of create a cohort so they can go forward. And then, guys, where, where was that other document? You don't? OK. OK. So Alex left us in a, sort of in, in a uh, short notice that we, we are supposed to do this. OK, so I think it, what I heard today is a scale-dependent distributions or pointing flux, uh, different measurement techniques sort of give a sort of interesting glimpse into pointing flux. And then Swarm telling us probably a C or alphabetic way of pointing flux, and then, and then also large scale super done data and then ampere data giving us large scale pictures. And then for example Gan Lu showed uh, Amy and then GCM results and that's required it's it's a great tool to see the global distributions but also the limitation in the in the resolutions. So what what are the things that we can go forward and then also coming up GDC uh, I think uh, instrument selection, instrument teams is still up in the air for the magnetometer. But last year at the CEDA meeting, the community was very concerned that pointing flux may not be measured uh, because we didn't know last year. So maybe we'll start with that. With the, I don't know if, if Doug, you want to say something on that GDC prospect or from what you can just say. Yeah, thank you, Smoko. I think, um, of course, pointing flux is absolutely critical to understand this region. So, you know, GDC needs to measure all the energy inputs, and pointing flux is a critical one. So, I don't know if Jared is here, but the the ongoing competitive phase A, the anticipation is that headquarters will be selected magnetometer, and there's also two thermal plasma instruments that are comp competition. The mosaic instrument, which is already selected, also measures ion drift, and so I think the slides that we gave yesterday. Rebecca Bishop is trying to make sure we can get permission from all the speakers to share those. As soon as we have that, we'll share them, and you'll be able to see the table of what's currently being measured by GDC and then what we anticipate might be measured. So I guess that answer your question, Tomoko. 
and the scale size is an important question because I think, um, uh, you know, right now this, the instruments that are on board have a certain cadence and a certain resolution and dynamic range, and um, we're just we're just keen to learn more about how that fits into the big picture. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the, the scale uh, component, it, just listening, it seems that uh, for the pointing flux that the highest resolution, temporal and spatial, that, that we can get from the ground and the space-based observations is, is really going to be important. Um, and so, you know, funding agencies in terms of Enhancing the capabilities of the ground-based instrumentation, I think, you know, is, is is absolutely important thing for this, you know, in addition to the modeling. So, just a comment. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And then I, I think it's really important to have multi-point, both space and ground, target this, and then scale distribution. I, I wonder if Bill has anything to add because his his uh, data were featured. So you don't know that Simon's my co I. Yeah. So, oh, well, <laughs> so, so I'll, I'll make another comment in a different direction. So, Dan, uh, Bill uh, pointed out the, um, you know, the alphanic flux in addition to the, the other part of the um, dual heating, uh, or the, 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 the alphanic flux versus the dual heating, the static component. So, um, you know, SuperNARN and Ampere are not going to be able to get that because they're doing. Um, potential solutions, and, and you know, if we can push other analysis techniques so we're not limited to just looking at this electrostatic potential, that could help us do a better job of characterizing the, the, the pointing flux. Yes, we, we need to patch those data together so that we can answer. Any other on this comments, uh, on, this, on this topic, scale distributions, how we can actually bring all different data, targeting different resolutions, different assumptions required to do the data analysis. Since I'm not a co-I with Bill and, <laughs> and Simon, I would just say as a, as a user of this data, getting the higher resolution as possible from the ground-based data is, you know, doable and you can do it. So, you know, getting that funded and be available by before or during the appropriate time would really be important just as a user and scientifically. Yeah, thank you for reinforcing the importance. So the other question I, I, we have uh, related to this is, uh, uh, so for example, GDC and maybe dynamic, we wanna see the IT response to those energy coming from the magnetosphere. And then maybe coming in the form of authentic waves. And then, so there's a question from last year, there's a lot of good discussion on a way, you know, it, it is authentic pointing flux. Where are they actually depositing energy? And then what are they doing to IT system? And then uh, there's, a, there's a discussion note, uh, but then if you have any, any thoughts to that, um, well, what, what can we do? Doug has comments. I don't have anything of my own, but Bill Lotko had a nice paper yeah. showing particularly that the alphanic power is deposited in the F region. So in concert with some previous discussion we saw, uh, I think that the UA presented, that's where the neutral density enhancement might be even more significant because of the alphanic. So that, that's very different from the quasi-static. I just want to um, comment that um, We've waited a long time for a satellite. We can't wait to get have GDC. It's going to be fantastic. In the meantime, there have been so many sounding rockets that have launched that have seen broad spectra of irregularities and alphane waves really going down to below you know, 100 meters. So we, we really need to, I think, look at some of those data sets, particularly in the cusp. In fact, Doug is very modest, but he was the PI of the uh, cusp rocket visions, too, that saw very, very strong irregularities in the cusp. So I think there's really a 
um, observations that we can use to help bolster the claim that the, uh, not, not just the irregularities, but the Alfane waves. I know Hassan Akbari has a nice paper from Poker Flat with the Alfane waves and seeing E and B. So I don't have those as slides, but those are available. Yeah, very, thank you very much. And then I'm going to come after you to get those uh, uh, nice papers that you mentioned. But are they those data available in public? Uh, Hassan's paper is published. Uh, Doug, I think some of the Visions 2 stuff is in work. And uh, you know, we, we certainly have made a lot of AGU presentations and things that we can make this a uh, How about data, data itself? Like oh, oh, eventually, sure. The data is definitely available. No question. Like, any, anything published is available, but I'm just thinking of the one in particular at the cost, but we have, we have several examples. And we can, we can make the data available, no, no question. The, that's the plan, but it's, you know, it's a lot of, you don't understand, with the, in the, with the sounding rocket investigation, you don't really have you know, the, you know, the arsenal of money to, to make this happen. Yes, yes. Can I ask you a question, Rob and Doug? So somebody asked today, earlier today, about whether that satellite study had found the smallest scale with significant point and flux input. And I'm wondering if your sounding rocket data, which gets down to much smaller scales, have you found the smallest scale that matters? <laughs> that's, that's a great question. I think I was asked earlier, you know, how how's, does it keep going up? And I think if you, I'm going to show this afternoon, when we look at the uh, AC electric fields from DE2, for example, they definitely extend out to 100 hertz, you know, but after that, they do sort of fall off. Uh, Mike Kelly was a big one talking about the spectrum of turbulence and all this, and so you can get pockets where the irregularities actually go to, you know, you know 10 meters, you know, but much smaller. Is there a lot of significant pointing flux? I don't know, but yeah, I, I do know that the structure goes at least to 100 meters. That's really great, and I think, sadly, we, we would have liked to have arcs make some of these measurements too, because it's not just how fine scale it is, but how extensive and how long it lasts. And so that's a question we just don't know. I mean, we have some data yeah. rockets, but we need to get those multi-point measurements to really understand that, too. Yet, So I, I was very impressed by Rob, or maybe uh, neutral winds uh, measurements from yeah. a sounding rocket. So do you want to? Could you, like, you call it aurora jet? Aurora jet, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking about that. That, um, Miguel Larson has published this. We see huge um, winds in the E region that associated with the aurora. Like, I'm talking about, you know, 300 meters per second. So normally when we look at the F region, the large winds, E cross B driven, here we also see them in the, associated in the aurora, high latitude, and they're not tidal. I mean, we love tides and all that, but really, there's, these are Lorentzian. They're, they're driven, associated with the aurora. That's why we need missions like in Lotus to really go down and, and measure these in dynamic, of course. And uh, so then associated with those large winds, there's obviously a lot of, uh, they drive electromagnetic energy, and, and that's a, a really sort of some missing physics. You know, we just haven't seen this. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited about those strong winds in the E region. <laughs> so Miguel has published those. We had one paper. We have another paper in work about rural jets. I'm going to show it at Coast Bar. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I got excited about <laughs> rocket measurements. Okay, any other, any other thoughts along this scale dependent um, and then al alphanic? and pointing flux. And then there's a one, um, I forgot the name, but it, the speaker linking what's going on in the magnetosphere. Where is this coming from, right? I mean, so we are interested in what, you know, what pointing flux at the different scales at the uh, DC or AC component, what, what they're doing to IT system, maybe driving strong winds and then all that density response that you showed. Right, and then also where they are coming from, right? So that's the first question to remind you. And then uh, if, okay, so moving on to the next topic, do, do you have, let, let's spend five, maybe like next few minutes to speak about, uh, discuss about hemispheric asymmetry. It's a very difficult to get there unless we have space mission, but if you have something to say about, maybe you have more super down data from the hemisphere. Hemisphere? Anything about north-south asymmetry and pointing flags? 
<laughs> так, thank you. I was very sorry to see that COSIA, a drive science center, did not get forward because this was a major topic of theirs. But GDC, of course, is going to also have this measurements in the two, two hemispheres. We want to understand how better to optimize those measurements to make sure we get comparable data at the same time in the same, same point. So looking forward to some input on that from the community and how we can best make that work. So you're collecting wish lists from the community for GDC? <laughs> yeah. What are your pressing questions? Oh, yes. Yeah. Maybe I can come on that. Uh, actually, Dolores has a paper shows the asymmetry in the point of flux using the uh, DMSP data. Uh, since she's, she's not here, maybe I can speak for her. Um, it seems like during quiet time and also storm time, uh, climatologically, the two hemisphere has very different distribution or magnitude of point flux. So certainly, you know, it's a, it's a common feature and uh, more study definitely needed. I'm gonna put you in spot. Do you see any so that like a pointing flux energy coming from magnetosphere is different. How that impact IT system? You have modeling study to add to that? Um, you're talking about the, the small scale one? Well, all scale, north of hemispheric asymmetry. Oh, okay. So in general, if you have a in hemispheric asymmetry, either with your heating or point of flux, uh, it will at first it will trick different response in the high latitude, neutral density, and that's not a surprise. And meanwhile, it will generate different um, TAD, propagating from high latitude to mid and low latitude, and cause very asymmetry response in the ionosphere and thermosphere in, uh, around the equatorial region even. Yeah, so definitely it's, the impact is global. Okay. <laughs> to talk. <laughs> Uh, it's just, okay. Um, well, I, I have a talk right after this, so I wasn't going to say anything, but I will just mention that I do have a paper on hemispherically immigrated uh, pointing flux, the asymmetry of that from north to south. And it's pretty clear that there is an asymmetry. And as far as the reason for that, um, it, it, it might just be due to the geomagnetic field, the Earth's geomagnetic field. So it seems like there's really a lot to sort out in terms of what's actually causing asymmetries, because there is. Um, you know, a 20% smaller geomagnetic field in the northern hemisphere typically, and that, that actually should create the, make the conductance be 30% larger on average in the northern hemisphere. So that would be an MI coupling effect that could create a big difference in pointing flux. And then I'll also comment on the spatial distribution of pointing flux things. I think that might be really important because it, it looks like they're actually sort of fairly event-like. You know, they're not really big, broad, spread out things. They may actually be fairly small which seems that we might actually have questions about whether the electric field maps all the way through the ionosphere, all the way through down to the bottom of the E region. And that becomes even more true um, in, um, I've been doing work on an electromagnetic calculation of the ionospheric conductance, which is normally considered to be the integrated conductivity, okay, except that I'm getting somewhat different results from the electrostatic and that I'm not getting the E field mapping all the way through the E region in all cases. And so that actually could mean that we're not necessarily seeing contributions from the bottom of the E region to the ionospheric conductance um, if the scales are not that big. Um, so I think it's really important to know what, you know, you kind of need to know the effective scale or if there is an effective scale or the sc distribution of scales, uh, even just to understand the, the conductance, the real effective conductance. Yeah, thank you very much. And then Russell gonna have a talk first in the afternoon, right? Yeah, the next one. Next one, yeah. one thirty. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, thank you. And then uh, five minutes to the top of the hour. And then I think uh, in the afternoon 
so we're gonna have Russell Cosgrove giving a talk, and then we we don't okay. So we have uh, we're gonna get that agenda soon. So we're gonna have another uh, discussion in the afternoon. So uh, after lunch break, please come back here, and then we're gonna have all the talks. So Russell Cosgrove, Shen Tian, and Bob Bob Prof. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Xia Jian Zhang, and then we're gonna have half an hour or so white paper preparation discussion time. And then I like that if possible, we're gonna form maybe groups because there are a few discussion topics. So I'm gonna figure this out. That we're gonna figure this out how to share the documents with uh, everyone so that you can actually add your name and then form the group going forward. Okay, so thank you very much for being here and then contributing to, to this important discussion. Okay. <laughs>